Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Very happy to introduce my guest this week. He is Ryan Wood, a gentleman I've known for many years, uh, someone very important in the UFO research community, in my opinion. Uh, he's in uh, private aerospace industry now, primarily, but Ryan still is um, very knowledgeable about the UFO phenomenon, and his most significant contribution, in my view, has been his work on uh, crash retrievals. He hosted, organized a crash retrieval conference for many years uh, during the early, the first decade of the 20th century, and I attended most of those as well. He was the author of a book about crash retrievals, and I think most significantly is the uh, organizer of the website with his father, Dr. Bob Wood, uh, MajesticDocuments.com, where Ryan and his dad have gone through the controversial and fascinating Majestic documents. These are leaked or otherwise uh, documents that have just come into the public domain uh, under the veil of a lot of argument and debate and are incredible. Hey, we have been discussing the Majestic documents in our community for about 25 years or more. So, Brian, welcome to the show. How, happy to have you here. Well, thank you, Richard, for that fine introduction. And uh, what people need to recognize is that there's a, a large collection of majestic documents from multiple sources spanning a long period of time. And granted, the sourcing and the provenance varies from uh, you know person or associate or, or document to document. Um, but you can't throw the whole um, you know, baby out with the bathwater, as they say, yeah. and uh, that if you look at it objectively, you, you have some documents and sources that are far more credible than, than others, but uh, people should approach the world with a sort of a neutral approach, uh, this 50-50 chance that it could be fake or, or genuine. Well, so. indeed, and um, we... Uh... We just got cut off and we picked it back up. You were about to mention Jamie Chandray, and, and the fact is he received the earliest MJ-12 documents back in 1984, so it's much more than 25 years. I'm, right. I'm thinking primarily, but I think you're right to mention that, I was thinking of the documents that you and your, your father have been analyzing. Most of those came out in the 90s and after, and... Um, I, I right. don't think as many people are as familiar. When they think of MJ-12 documents, they think of those original, you know, the Truman Memo establishing MJ-12 and the signature debate and all of that stuff that Philip Klass got into. But what you and your father have organized is something much more detailed than those original MJ-12 docs. Yeah, um, yeah. It, there's, there's some 3,700 pages of documents from confidential to top secret code word um, that comprised that primary collection of quote majestic documents. The one that's the sort of highest on my credibility list because I've done the most personal investigation on and has been vetted the most thoroughly is the Special Operations Manual Extraterrestrial Entities Technology Recovery and Disposal. Yeah, that might be a good place to start with because I'm holding a, a, the pamphlet in my hand right here. This is, uh, you know, after the original MJ-12 docs came out in 84, that was to Jamie Chandray. Uh, there was the, um, the Cutler Twining memo uh, was found, but then where then it was really this document that came out in, in 1994 in the mailbox of the researcher Don Berliner, correct? Yeah, that's right. Don yeah. Berliner, a, a, a green pharmacies box mailed from La Crosse, Wisconsin, with undeveloped Triax film, uh, which he, uh, just after he'd come back from the uh, Oshkosh uh, experimental aircraft show where he was reporting. So, Wow. My suspicion and speculation is that somewhere in that milieu of 10, 15,000 of aviation uh, people, enthusiasts, he talked to somebody or somebody had the idea 
let's right send them some stuff. Right. So not even a UFO event so much as an aviation event. Right. Yes, that's right. that's true. And La Crosse, Wisconsin, was the um, the Quillen Pharmacy in La Crosse, Wisconsin, was the, where it was um, mailed from. Interesting. And, uh, yeah, and then you start the long on authentication process of uh, you know getting the originals, blowing them up, trying to reproduce it all, and study all the elements of of uh, anachronisms and um, font and typography and and provenance stuff for right. this special operations manual. Well, can we can we go through the content of it for listeners just a little bit? Okay, because I think not. Everyone really knows what this document says. I mean, it's essentially, it's a manual that uh, it's in photographic form. And in fact, when you look at the, the images, you see a man's hand holding the the booklet down while he's seemingly surreptitiously photographing it. And it has a, uh, a list of, um, you know, who has taken the, the document out. And the n- remarks are like the uh, MJ4, MJ1. MJ4 took it out most of the time uh, during yep. the 1950s. And then it's it's really, it's a manual for recovering. And it says right here, extraterrestrial entities and technology recovery and disposal. So when a crash happens of a UFO, this is a short manual of the protocols of how to deal with it. And that means recovering the craft, recovering the bodies, dealing with the press, and so much more. So I wonder if you can get into right. some of this. Yeah, no, uh, it's, um, it's it's neatly organized. It, it talks about the the scope of of the group and uh, being targeted at uh, MJ12 uh, recovery units. Uh, but it gives a little history too, um, established by special classified presidential order on 24 September 47. Uh, at the recommendation of uh, Forrestal and mm-hmm. Vannevar Bush, mm-hmm. um, and it's a you know top secret research and development intelligence group, directly responsible only to the president at the time. So this is fifty four, mm-hmm. so that would be Eisenhower, I guess. Yeah. Um, and and so people, it's a top secret research and development intelligence group. So they're trying to do reverse engineering and R&D and leverage and exploit the technology. Uh, That's the overarching goal. Um, There's a current assessment of the situation. There's uh, descriptions of craft. Uh, Maybe most stunningly, there's uh, some high quality paragraphs of extraterrestrial biological entities, you know, or EBEs mm-hmm. that describe EBE type one and EBE type two. Um, right. The, the type two is the typical sort of television image of the, the gray alien with the large slanted eyes and wrap around. And, um, but type one is a little weirder, you know, it's a little more oriental race, um, right. It's a, a pale, chalky yellow in color, thick skin, more pebbled in appearance with, uh, you know, eyes are small and wide set and almond shaped, um, but, but not the big black eyes. So it's, it's a fascinating, and, and, you know, today there's books and other literature that go on to describe multiple other races with uh, more description. Mm. Um, it, it also talks about uh, press blackout and how you do the denial and the discrediting and deceptive statements uh, and examples of that. And then the practical methods of, of uh, removal and transport uh, and cleansing the exactly. area. And, and then most importantly, you know, what to do with the, the materials. Uh, so they have uh, 11 categories of, of what code to stamp on the uh, artifact and where, where to ship it. 
You know, so the, the general categories are, you know, aircraft, um, intact electronic or mechanical devices, damaged devices, power plants, uh, identified fragments, unidentified fragments, supplies and provisions. It's, it's interesting that um, there would be supplies and provisions, uh, mm-hmm. I suppose. L- living entities, uh, you know, with a big asterisk next to it, uh, a living entity must be contained in total isolation pending arrival of OPNAC personnel. We're not yes. quite sure of what OPNAC means. Uh, precisely in the 1954 context. That's one of the open authentication questions. Uh-huh. I mean, yeah, it means some operational uh, personnel uh, group, but prove to me in a reference document what OPNAC is in context in 1954. I mean, that's the sort of thing that I'm looking for. Right, no, I get it. Um, no, the document... And then, oh, go on, please. So, and then the non-living entities and mm-hmm. media and um, media like printed matter, electronic recordings, maps, mm-hmm. charts, photographs, film, et cetera. And then maybe the things that we took rather than things that were recovered from the craft. And then weapons, uh, any device or portion of device uh, to be an offensive or defensive weaponry. Um, and most of this stuff goes to Area 51, S4. Some of it goes to the Blue Lab at Wright-Patterson um, Air Force Base. In, in 1954, right. uh, and then it's more, you know, descriptions of those general categories, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and it goes on to special handling and crating, and then you know how to deal with the EBEs, isolation and custody, what to do with the non-living organisms, um, and uh, how to preserve the situation. Uh, and then there's a, a chapter, chapter six, called the UFO Identification Guide. Right. Um, and what's interesting about this is that it was not photographed in the original leaked oh, collection. Is that right? It, it was. It was. Uh, it was. Ant- there was nothing there in those pages. But through the normal FOIA process, one of the ufological researchers got. A UFO B guide, you know, mm-hmm. declassified or through FOIA, and and it was, you know, eight and a half by eleven Times New Roman typed single and a half space, you know, sort of document. But when you take that document in its fifteen pages or something as it was released and retype it and follow the format rules of the Special Operations Manual. It beautifully fits in to the manual, and the page numbers line up with the table of contents. Oh, that's fascinating! So it it actually yeah. might be connected to this document legitimately, is what you're you're uh, indicating. Yeah, well, the, certainly the table yeah. of contents right. calls it a UFO B identification right. guide. So the table of contents has the right title, and then when you look at the um, and the identification criteria and possible origins. So, I mean, there are one, one, two, three, three line items with appropriate paragraphs and paging that ideally line up. So in other Um, words, the original um, document or um, film that went to Don Berliner did not have, it had the UFOB guide in the table of contents, but not in the document itself. And when the UFOB guide came out through FOIA, it, it fit perfectly in the gap. Yes. Is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. very interesting. Very interesting. I yeah. Don't, it's, yeah. So yeah. in terms of uh, trying to authenticate this, I know that you, you've spent a lot of time with it. Your dad spent a lot of time with it. A lot of folks have said this is not authentic. Uh, they didn't believe in it. Um, it just takes so much criticism. But are there, um, you know, what do you think are some of the strong reasons why you think this document should be considered authentic? Well, um, the one that I was, well, it was stamped uh, Kirkland Air Force Base Building 21, Unit KB-88 um, on the inside cover. Uh, And so 
the claim was that it's from Kirkland Air Force Base. And when I went to the facilities department at Kirkland Air Force Base mm -hmm. and said, well, you know, do you have a, um, a Building 21? Um, they said, well, not right now, but we used to have one and uh, pulled out the old maps and said, oh, this is it. And uh, it's an old cinder block uh, building. Hmm. And then the next step that I did was on the change control page, um, which has the initials of, of EWL and JRT that checked right. out and modified these pages exactly. all the way up until August of 56. Mm -hmm. um, I went to the Albuquerque, New Mexico phone book and looked for the initials EWL and JRT. Um, and sure uh -huh. enough, I found two military officers that had those initials. Yes. And they were both on Perimeter Road inside Kirkland Air Force Base. Um, are they, were they important historically? I mean, they are... <clears throat> Uh, associated as having MJ positions, right? One is one of them was JRT is MJ four, EWL. Oh no, but there's a difference, isn't there? So yeah, there's, no, I they're think not these related. Are the authorizations uh, is authorized by MJ four, uh, and um, they were authorized to remove the documents based on that yeah. authorization. Interesting. Yeah. So, what was? In, did you learn anything interesting about those two individuals? Well, I got their names and then um, begin to research their uh, files and um, military personnel records. Mm -hmm. And I actually had one private detective group that found the EWL and um, inter he's dead, was buried, and the, um, the detectives uh, interviewed his wife, um, but she was pretty closed mouth of, other than say he did, you know, special military work. Um, so I didn't find much other than to say that, wow, to have two of the correct people with the right initials on Kirkland Air Force Base right. on per Perimeter Road. That was pretty much a zinger for me um, as far as the provenance of the document goes. Um, right. I mean, it would have been interesting if you had immediately just run into a dead end, got nowhere, but you actually didn't hit a dead end. You got two very intriguing suggestive leads. Right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and then then you go to the next level of of authenticity, and this is something that my father, Doctor Bob Wood, focused on. Is he he retyped the whole manual from the photographs, and and when you very carefully do that, he discovered some entomology related uh, subtleties, uh, and the example would be. Uh, first aid um, in the manual, first and aid are capitalized, mm -hmm. initial capitalized, uh, which was an appropriate uh, methodology for government manuals in the 50s. But nowadays, um, or even in the 80s, it's lowercase and, and all a single word. First date. Right. So all of uh, the uh, looking for anachronisms, uh, mistakes, anomalies. And I think what you're suggesting is that there were none. Uh, there are no significant or noteworthy anomalies or anachronisms in the in the text. Is that accurate? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and to the extent that uh, a single word like screwdriver was actually uh, two words um, in the manual, but it's all commonplace now. It's, right. it's a single word. Right, right. And so he, there's things like that. And then there's um, our interview with Robert McCarter, a retired government printing officer uh, who wrote the uh, several the 50s era or 60s era, I can't remember which, uh, government 
printing style manuals. So if you've ever looked at a government printing style manual, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like an inch and a half thick. It's very dense. It's a textbook um, for all the people to print stuff. And we showed him this manual and he looked at it and looked through the pages that he did. We, we, my dad and I were sitting at a card table in his office, or actually at his home in, um, in uh, I think it was in Virginia or Washington, D.C. Um, and after some length of time, we asked him, well, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you know, based on the title, I would think it was faux, a fake. Uh, however, um, because it has the raised Z uh, in synchronized and several other cases, uh, I think it's totally authentic because it was done on a hot lead printing press um, and it was either done uh, in the classified vault in the basement of the government printing office or the basement uh, office at the Pentagon. Fascinating. Um, so and, he identified the printer because of its unique the very uh, uh, idiosyncratic, unique qualities that it that it had is what it sounds like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, so he he guaranteed that it was done um, with a hot lead printing press, uh, and he, he said also the, the use of uh, ligatures, which is uh, when several words or several letters get um, put together in a certain way in type typeset mm -hmm. um, is indicative of hot lead printing press. So now you have to think of yourself, okay, so being skeptical, you might say, well, okay, it's 1994 when Don Berliner gets this. Right. Um, somebody has to have created it. Um, with such and, a printer, which are not uh, run of the mill, they're only in a very certain number of areas, I gather, and they are right. basically are they uh, all uh, U.S. government or are they private ones that, that you knew? Uh, yeah, it was on a um, a monotype modern printing press. Mm -hmm. So yes, they're they're they were available. They were around. Several newspapers had them and so okay. forth. Um, but uh, you uh, couldn't. But you'd have to get you the couldn't exact use government. modern computers at all because uh, Quark Express, which was the first generation of things that became Adobe and so forth, mm -hmm. didn't have support for l ligatures or the ability to raise Z's, or it was it was junk. It would have had to been done uh, completely old school. With exact terminology for the period, right? right? So, and then the other thing that you mentioned, and I just want to point this out, uh, in one of your comments, you talk about the reference page. This is page 28. And I'm just going to read something that you'd written. I, it may still be on your website. I printed this off years ago. But you wrote, uh -huh. the last page is very impressive. The references are genuine on page uh, 28. You can go to the archives and get a 1954 document and get the same reference numbers, the same reference titles, word for word, comma for comma. I'm looking at this reference page, and it um, des describes uh, applicable regulations, AR 380-4, military right. security, and then all of these others. So what does this mean, and, and why is that a significant uh, find in your opinion? Well, it, it means that, you know, if, if you had to, if you wanted to fake it, you, you would have to have done a fair amount of research or been uh, military or skilled in creating uh, right. manuals. So it just goes to the fact that it's more uh, le legitimate and and it's more challenging to implement uh, a fake. But let, let me let me say that is this beyond the CIA or beyond KGB? I would say no. Um, however, they are not going to do something like this unless there was some sort of purpose 
or strategy or disinformation or psychological warfare goal. Okay, let's take a quick break. This is Richard Dolan. I'm here with Ryan Wood. You're listening to KGRA Radio. We will be right back. We're back. I'm here with Ryan Wood, and we've just been talking about whether uh, the majestic documents could have been a disinformation created by the CIA or KGB or some other organization. Well, let me let me uh, tack on to that because I've thought about this a lot too, and it's not simply in relation to the Psalm 101, which is, as you say, I agree with you completely, highly sophisticated. I mean, very, very precisely sophisticated in so many ways, but. All of these majestic documents. I remember, um, I think in 2002 or so, when I first decided, I was a new guy in the UFO field back then, and I hadn't yet read them, the majestic documents. And I, I somewhat dreaded it because I knew there was all of this debate going on about it. And there were so many of them. But I bit the bullet. I went to your website. I printed them all off. I've comb bound them, which I still have right here. And I read them. And I just read them in chronological order. And it was an incredible experience for me. I, let me tell you, going through all of these, I mean, some of these titles, uh, you know, you've got uh, the famous White Hot Memo. You've got the, yeah. uh, you know, going back even further, some others, General Vandenberg to Chief of Staff, 1947. Uh, unidentified aircraft sightings over the U.S., top secret eyes only intelligence estimate, September 47. These are amazing documents. And my conclusion upon uh, finishing all of them was, A, there's no way one person would have been able to crank these out on their own uh, as a fake, not even remotely chance. That's a ridiculous idea. If these were fake, as you say, you're talking teams of PhDs with the highest levels of security classification and they would have to be doing this for a purpose. And I've often wondered, what would that purpose be? If it's U.S. disinfo against the Soviets, well, that in a sense would almost be proof that the UFO phenomenon is real because the Soviets aren't dummies. They're, they are not going to be fooled by disinformation if they knew the whole UFO thing was, was nonsense. And, right. and reverse, if the Soviets are doing it against the Americans. And I just wondered, if it's disinfo, who is it directed against? And there's no right. answer that really makes sense to me. Yeah, that's right. The only the only thing that's whimsically logical is is that you you leak this to the Chinese or something and say, if you mess with us, we're gonna just fry your ass with alien technology. Uh, but it, this is such a crude approach that you would never really do that. You would no, absolutely you, you do it differently. I fully agree. So this has always been the problem um, in t emotionally in dealing and grasping with these MJ-12 documents. The um, problem number one is that they've never, they're orphans. You know, no one is uh, claiming them officially, that is, but they, they won't go away. They're too powerful in my view. So for that reason, yeah. I'm glad that we're chatting about it. Um, may I ask yeah. you if you would, uh, if we could shift gears for a minute and can you talk a little bit about Tim Cooper? It seems to me that he's a very, very important in this because he is the source, uh, or he had possession, I guess I should say, of a large number of these documents before you and your dad acquired them. Can you talk right. a little bit about that and how he apparently got these documents and then you got them? So these are not negatives, by the way. These aren't photographic negatives. These are actual pieces of paper. Uh, people should know this that um, I know many of them have been sh subjected to their own forensic analysis. But if you can talk about mm -hmm. Tim Cooper, that might be um, that might be a good place to start. Yeah, uh, well, Tim, Tim Cooper is um, the son of Harry B. Cooper. And Harry B. Cooper ran a uh, printing office at uh, Ent Air Force Base. That's in Colorado. Yeah, which is in, right? in Colorado. Yeah. Um, it's now called Peterson Air Force Base. And he got a uh, Air Force commendation um, from Curtis LeMay that says, thank you for your outstanding work in the UFO, the USAF 
UFO program um, from time to time. I remember the dates. Um, and this is, you know, gold seal signed. Uh, you know, we've got color photographs. I've held the original in my hand. You know, there's no, mm -hmm. no doubt that this is real. So it, it is his father um, that knew the people, had the relationships, and was familiar with some of the personnel and people, because I suspect that they came to him and said, here, print this for us. It's, it's a top secret special operations manual or a top secret document or what have you. And he developed some um, contacts and relations. And then, and I'm speculating now, mm -hmm. I believe that Tim Cooper became interested in UFOs through his father's knowledge. Sure. And proceeded to write a lot of Freedom of Information Act requests in the uh, in the 80s and into the 90s. And um, either the people that were reviewing those requests or got wind of his interest mm -hmm. um, decided that... Uh, uh, it's time. Uh, I've done too much damage to my, you know, country or whatever, and and had a, a change of heart. And Thomas Cantwheel is the name of the source, uh, amongst several other ones, that Thomas Cantwheel delivered stuff in person uh, to Tim Cooper, but he also got stuff in his P.O. box. Um, with the, uh, sometimes it said dash one um, uh, in the upper corner of the documents. And that was a different source than sometimes it said dash two, I think. Um, and sometimes he, he got a couple of, so there's several sources that sort of were, were data drops that happened through Tim Cooper and Thomas Cantwheel, um, that we believe are separate sources. But now, yes, Cant all in all... Cantwheel was retired Army counterintelligence, um, says right. here on your site. But did, didn't uh, some of Cooper's documents came via his father, are you saying, and some came through Cantwheel? Is that accurate, or am I getting that wrong? Uh, that's, to my knowledge, that's inaccurate. All of it came through... Can't wheel, can't wheel. Okay. And, and other people that put stuff in his mailbox. Um, I think one time he said... Um, oh, but he got these that, people be, because uh, he. Uh, it seems like he got the attention of someone because of his number of FOIA requests. That would be one right, speculation. Yes. Right, or his, his father mentioned something to somebody, you yeah. know, I'm just speculating as right, to right. how that happened. Exactly. I remember Tim saying, well, one time I opened my P.O. box and it, inside my Time magazine or or tucked in its middle um, of the curve was a bunch of documents in a manila envelope. It, it, was, it wasn't mailed. It was just stuck there. Oh. And, just dropped off. Yeah. And, and you know, you don't know whether or not people just crack your code on your your old twist style mailbox, which were, uh, you know, junk back then, um, or somebody was in the post office and actually put it in there. Um, but this is so, really very interesting indeed. And I mean, to the uh, accusation that Cooper himself would be complicit or involved in uh, hoaxing these documents. I, I recall you saying on a number of occasions you didn't you had no belief at all that Cooper would be involved in such an activity. Is that right? Yeah, I'd say um, it's beyond. After you meet him and talk to him and his smoking and style and his, we've seen m many things that he wrote originally by himself. He he wrote. Uh, um, report on four deep 
wrote sources on White Sands. And my father studied his writing fairly well. And his his grammar, his misspellings, his um, his genuine writing style uh, is at odds with the overwhelming sophistication and quality right. of the documents. Right. And then, so the only other uh, hoax scenario, I guess it seems to me, is, is if uh, Cantwell and other sources were feeding him these fake documents a la kind of a Benowitz campaign, I suppose, someone might think. But that seems odd too, doesn't it? I mean, um, does that make any sense yeah. to you? Not not much. Yeah. Um, I, I think... I think that the genuine situation is that you had somebody in the interplanetary phenomenon unit or the IPU, mm -hmm. that's where Cantwell allegedly worked, which the Air Force has officially admitted existed, <laughs> part of the uh, uh, assistant chief of staff for intelligence uh, in G2 in the uh, Air Force, and that he genuinely was dying and felt that the truth should come out or he was um, frustrated with the the evil things that uh, they had done in the past um, allegedly you know amongst the other reasons that Kennedy might have been assassinated was uh, that he wanted to share the truth uh, about ETs with um, America or the Russians Right. So, I mean, that's that's a longer, deeper topic, but it, it, I'll underscore the fact that it, it, there is one story that um, the Tim would tell you today, and that was, um, you know, in, in 63, it's late 63, right? Um, when Kennedy was assassinated, he came home and his father had the TV on and he had his head in his hands and he was crying and, and said, you know, Oh my God, they really did it. Uh -huh. And, and so that made a vivid impression on Tim. Um, and, um, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that that story from Tim, uh, recounting what his father experienced that is real um and uh would you want it we've got uh looks like let me see how many minutes we've got about 15 minutes left <laughs> we've really okay gone. um can you talk a little bit about the burned memo is that uh what's your your sure. so the burned memo just very quickly uh, maybe you could just describe it for listeners it's really it's very fascinating and this is all dealing with the assassination of John F. Kennedy, described in the, as the code name Lancer. Uh, this is like a hit on the president, definitely connected to the UFO subject. And what's your take on this? Well, I'm trying to recall uh, how these original documents uh, arrived. Um, it slips my mind. Mm -hmm. um, but what what's interesting about them is that they're original. Uh, so it's original paper with watermark and um, little burn marks that are in the uh, edges and in some cases in the paper. The, the claim is that uh, it was thrown into the fire, but then somebody pulled it out of the fire. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm skeptical of, of that. Uh, scenario. Uh, but the things that make it interesting is that we had um, spec and forensic laboratories do the ink analysis. There's, um, there's, it says top secret MJ-12 on it in sort of a purple ink. And so you can determine the age of the ink and do liquid chromatography on uh, the ink, and I think there's some ballpoint pen writing on those pages too, and we did some ballpoint pen ink work mm -hmm. too, uh, all indicating that these are old documents. Um, you know, they're 
they weren't modern. They were in the seventies or sixties or fifties. Okay. Um, and that's all you can sort of determine from the forensic testing. The, the watermark is still sort of an unresolved, interesting dilemma is that you can, you can get the watermark. You can't find it, uh, obviously, but I found some stuff that was very similar um, on CIA documents in the National Archives. Okay. Um, and I'd love to spend more time looking at original documents in the National Archives. Just comparing the style and so forth? Yeah, yeah comp right. you're looking for the watermark. Yes, right, right, basically, right. you know, you don't, maybe you make a custom watermark for just the counterintelligence people. Um, and maybe that's it. Maybe that's what you do is you right. just focus on CIA counterintelligence documents, whatever mm -hmm. you can get declassified. And see um, if they have uh, unique watermarks. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and just see whether or not we can compare and nail down. Oh Yeah this is the right watermark. And so... But here's the thing that you're that, saying. If, if this, even if this were created as a hoax, it would have to have been not later, it seems, than the 1970s, right? Um, right. And, and it could very well have been done in the 60s. Well, it couldn't have been done in the 50s because the, no, but, the dating is much later than the 1950s. So, that's right. Uh, so yeah. what we're saying is even if it were done as a hoax, it would have to have been a hoax way, way back then and then just would have had to sit for several right. decades in a filing cabinet or a box or somewhere. Uh, makes no sense whatsoever to me. And then someone right. would pull it out and send it to Tim Cooper in uh in california seriously that's that's a that's a stretch i mean if, if you've got skeptics right, well, saying that this is a stretch that this is real i would say it's more of a stretch to look at the scenario that we're seeing here in old documents sitting around for for decades why create a fake document like this in the 70s and just let it sit right particularly when it's you know evidence of really bad things <laughs> absolutely fascinating yeah, so I I think that Rock of, uh, Occam's razor is is on point here. You know, it it is what it is. The most simplest answer is that it's counterintelligence document. It's real. It's authentic. It talks about uh, assassination. It talks about uh, other uh, top secret code word projects called Enviro. And I don't have it in front of me, but maybe you. And rattle off a few more of the code words. Well, I'm looking oh. at uh, the, I've um, got it right here. So let's see. Um, Project Majestic uh, and Jehovah. Evo Jehovah. Eviro. Yeah. Uh, Project Parasite and Project Parhelion are yeah. referenced projects here. This is, this is by the way, well, a top secret from the director of, the, of CIA. Two MJ two MJ three four five six and seven, and it's right. uh, it is a, a very carefully worded uh, memo on the need essentially that if if Lancer that is the code name for John F Kennedy ref refuses to cooperate on the matter essentially of keeping this subject away from the the Russians away from the Soviets, which is what it seemed like he was wanting to increase cooperation and communication, then uh, the operation must be wet, I think is what they were describing. It was basically, yeah. they were talking about an assassination against him. Right. And the, the word Jehovah is interesting because I, I once many years ago uh, asked Linda Howe, have you ever heard of the word Jehovah? Mm -hmm. And... She pulled me aside and got long-faced and um, very serious and said, Jehovah's one mean son of a bitch uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and implied that it was basically an alien um, or, you know, 
maybe a group of aliens, I'm speculating, uh, and that, but it basically had to do with the EBEs or biological entities. Uh, right. It's very funny. I, I recently was with Linda at the conference Contact in the Desert, and for whatever reason, that came up between her and myself. She brought up Jehovah very briefly. Really? Yeah, yeah. I'm not kidding wow. you. It's, <laughs> it was on her mind. And I'm sure you talk, chatted with her about this some time ago, but I'm talking about just a, a few days ago, less than a week ago. Isn't that funny? So, yeah, yeah I think um, I can absolutely... Uh, confirm she's this is something that is important to her so yeah isn't that funny yeah so the um that's the one of the interesting elements of the majestic documents not only do you have leaked photocopies and leaked film but you also have some leaked originals and th that helps the overall credibility um you know it's just uh, this weekend, my, my dad was in town to give a talk at the uh, Society for Scientific Exploration, uh, SSE, here yeah. in Colorado. And his talk title was uh, UFOs, Secrecy, and Consciousness. Um, and it was, you know, he is more out there than I am. Uh, so he... He, he went deep into the space station, solar warden, Antarctica, um, you know, gravity control, uh, things that I'm, I haven't, I haven't caught up with him because I'm, I'm more in the dark uh, because I haven't, I haven't studied things. But one of the people that was there was fascinated with um, the, power plants and, you know, aircraft or the, the ETs don't travel with kerosene or burn it. Right. And there's a description in the white hot report of a, a neutronic power plant. And they, they had mass spectroscopy in uh, 1947. And so this, they have a breakdown of, of the elements of, uh, the small neutronic power plant found inside of ULAT-1, Unidentified Lenticular Aerodyne uh -huh. Technology 1. And, and there are um, 10 uh, line items and, you know, uranium hexachloride uh, or hexafluoride, uh, hydrogen fluorine gas, uranium and water tetrafluoride, powdered magnesium and potassium chlorate, and dot, dot, dot. Uh, but, but I was thinking to myself, well, I don't think anybody's done a decent job of just trying to do the, you got the ingredients for the soup. Mm -hmm. Can, can you figure out with normal science how to make this or, you know, does this make sense at yeah, all? Yeah. Is there any configuration of the soup that might, uh, might lead to something. Well, if this is out, out of the MJ-12 docs, of Majestic docs, I'm going to guess it does make sense because to me, I'll just be, I'm going to put my opinion right out here. These documents strike me as legit and they are of incredible sophistication. Like people don't, they don't have, most folks don't have an appreciation of just how deeply sophisticated the discussions in these documents are. I, we're almost out of time. I would like to ask you, were there any one of these documents that you determined clearly to be a fake or a hoax in one way or another? The, the answer is no. Are there questions that I still have on some documents? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, not, nothing that seems, um, that appears to be or that I can prove is um, uh, a fake. Now, there's some documents that, don't have enough verifiable information. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to investigate. Because there's nothing in them to corroborate or check mm -hmm. uh, with, within reason. And those are the ones that are the most suspicious. Because if if, if there's nothing to check, um, then you know you're you can't move the needle one no, way I... or the other. You're sort of in the neutral spot. So there would be a possibility that, let's say, a couple of documents that might have arrived 
uh, Tim Cooper's mailbox, there could have been a couple of fake ones tossed in with some genuine ones. Do you entertain that? Or do you think most likely these are legit? I entertain that. Um, even in uh, Cantwheel's uh, sign-off note, um, you know, before I die sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, he, he, he says that, is that, you know, I gave you some fake stuff. Um, sorry about that. Uh, but I suspect that it's more... Let me phrase this right. Sure. Is that you don't know where Cantwheel got his information. I once had a remote viewer uh, target these documents and say, "Are they are they legitimate? Are uh -huh. they real? Right? Where where do they come from?" And uh, you know, to the extent the remote viewing is accurate, the the answer was um, it's muddled. It was not clear um, that, and I didn't target specific document at a time. I, uh -huh. So the, it was no clear answer one way or the other. And the challenge for the UFO community and for us and for people that care is to just do the blocking and tackling, do the research and understand the secret history of uh, the world. Yeah, I, I would. Thank you, Ryan. I'm going to encourage everyone who's interested in, in this conversation, please to go to MajesticDocuments.com. This is uh, Ryan and his dad, Bob Wood's website. It's uh, a website that I have come back to many times, I must say. I think it is a wealth of knowledge and the uh, of information. The problem has always yeah. been it's, you know, we don't have absolute confirmation but as time goes by my own opinion is that these documents they are not going away and they they are still standing and there's a tremendous amount of research available on that site that uh, readers can look into to, to uh, understand the work that that ryan and dr bob wood went through to authenticate and to at least understand these documents there's a lot of backstory with all of these it is absolutely worth looking into yeah, so, I might also add that uh, the other website, uh, there's one called the Special Operations Manual dot com, uh, that is totally and exclusively dedicated to the Special Operations Manual uh, and its authenticity and comments and uh, research. Excellent. Uh, and response to all the objections that people might have raised over time. Uh, people should also know you wrote a really excellent book called Magic Eyes Only, which is subtitled Earth's Encounters with Extraterrestrial Technology. This is a uh, the best book, in my view, on uh, UFO crash retrievals. And in this book, you go through a large number of alleged crash retrievals. And you, you see, you apply the same type of uh, analysis and metric to those stories as you do to the, MJ, the majestic documents, it seems to me. You kind of rank them on a scale of, scale of credibility. And it's a really great read, and I would encourage um, people to go check that out. I don't, is that readily available, Ryan? Uh, no, it's not readily available. I didn't think uh, so. You know, on Amazon, people want uh, two hundred bucks for it. Um, <laughs> well, maybe one day you'll get it. Re I don't know. It's a very, very fine book. I must say. Yeah. It's well, a the very thing is book. that there's seventy four crash retrievals reviewed and ranked in that book, and I have another fifty or so on my desk. Um, All right, man. Going into the second edition. So that's it. That's the project. Good. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Okay. Well, Ryan, we we have run out of time. Is there anything else you want folks to know about um, where to reach you? Is the website sufficient? No, no, the website's fine. Yeah, yeah I'm good. good. Well, I just want to know. It's been great talking with you. I've uh, always appreciated the work that you have done in in this field of UFO research. It's been hardcore, genuine, document-based research that is the kind that we all need and benefit from. And uh, for my part, I, I want to thank you and your dad, Dr. Bob Wood, for the uh, really important work that you've both done. And I'm very grateful for the chance to chat with you about these fascinating, majestic documents. Thank you so much, Richard. And uh, don't neglect the fact that you've done some heavy lifting in the books that you've written, too. Thanks very uh, much. 
That's all we've got time for here on KGRA Radio. If you want to hear more of these episodes, you can go to kgraradio.com for archives of this program and many other fine programs as well. You can also go to my YouTube channel, Richard Dolan, for all of the shows I've done from 2018 till now. If you want more, go to richarddolanmembers.com where you will find special behind-the-scenes interviews with all of my guests and much, much more. Thanks again to my guest, and thank you for listening. Remember, while we learn and grow and search for the truth, let's be good to each other. Later.